Okay, this will serve as a forward to the idea, the concept that we want to be dealing with. And uh, I will tell you that the Adventist perspective on what we're going to be talking about is unique. I don't know of anyone else out there who understands this basic Christian theology, and it is basic. As a youth, I was first exposed to the subject of salvation, S-A-L-V, salvation, when a very fine, very missionary-minded Baptist minister began knocking on doors in our community. After introducing himself, he announced, there's no church in this neighborhood, and I intend to build a church here to the glory of God. Why don't you come join me? It was in that fledgling Baptist church that I first heard the question, are you saved? Have you received the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? You must have salvation. Now, if you've been exposed to Baptist teaching and theology, let me tell you, this is the heart of the Baptist Christian theology right here. Are you saved? Have you accepted Christ as your personal Savior? You must have salvation. I think it's wonderful. I think... It's marvelous. This was the heart and thrust of Billy Graham's crusade for years. This is what he preached. With this sanctuary tabernacle temple discussion, my intent is to focus first on the earthly down here and afterward attempt to shift the perspective, the view, and focus from the human to the heavenly. In other words, I want to try and understand the down here view and the up there view. We're talking about in the sanctuary service, which is a parable telling the story of salvation. So I went to the dictionary. The word salvation as a noun means this, a saving or being saved from danger, evil, difficulty, or danger. That's one. Number two, a person or thing that is a means, cause, or source of preservation or rescue. We're talking about salvation. And the third definition is theological. Theological meaning it has to do with God stuff and Bible stuff. Deliverance from sin and from the penalties of sin. Redemption. I can only assume that my readers or hearers will understand I'm aware of traditional Christian views regarding the necessity for and the process of salvation. I also assume my readers or hearers recognize that inspiration and revelation in Scripture are much larger and deeper than most of us will comprehend this side of the kingdom. So I do not for even an instant believe that, well, my view regarding these matters, my conclusions regarding these matters, is the only way a person can be saved. I just, I don't believe that at all. But I believe there are things here that God would want us to understand if we care to know more about Him and what is going on. So we had definition from the dictionary on salvation. Saved. Let's talk about, are you saved? So I pose these two questions. Saved from what? And saved when? Even as a youth, the question, are you saved, seemed puzzling and incomplete. If by the question, are you saved, one actually means, are your sins forgiven, the answer is yes. If that's what saved means, God has forgiven my sins, the answer is yes. But forgiveness is not salvation. And this is where the rub really comes, at the theological level, okay? At, at, at the Bible sanctuary level. This is where the rub comes. Uh, God has forgiven your sins. Marvelous. But I'm still here. When salvation arrives, I won't still be here. Salvation is getting out of here. It's no longer putting up with here. And most Christians 
believe that forgiveness and salvation are one and the same. They are not. Not at all. Forgiveness is not salvation, yet it is in this very sense forgiveness equals salvation. See Webster's theological definition again. That many Christians understand and use the expression saved. Forgiveness is free of charge. We can use the word grace here and say it's unmerited favor. It's God forgiving me and he's not charging me for what he's giving me. Forgiveness is free of charge, but salvation is expensive. Nobody gets out of here without somebody paying a ransom price. Very expensive. By God's grace, His loving mercy and compassion and His promise to forgive me, that's God's part, and by faith, my part, I have forgiveness. But forgiveness is not salvation. Certainly not salvation in the sense or with the meaning it was preached by the apostles or heard and believed by early Christians. Words are defined not simply by their usage as nouns, verbs, etc., but also by the tense in which the words are framed. The Philippian jailer cried, listen to this. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they, that was Paul and Silas, said, this is Acts 16, they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Salvation was promised to the jailer in the future tense. <coughs> shall is future tense. You shall be saved. You shall be freed from... Saved or salvation was promised to the jailer in the future tense. Belief or faith was his to exercise. That's the sinner's part at that moment in time. Beyond that, to save him in his house, the ultimate reality of the saved condition salvation is God's part. And it's expressed in Scripture in the future perfect tense. Shall be in the future saved. A completed process and condition. Someone will surely protest, but Jesus said to Zacchaeus, This day has salvation come to this house. Remember Zacchaeus, the wee little man that climbed up in the sycamore tree? Jesus said, I'm going to your house. So Jesus is present with a group of people at Zacchaeus' house. And Zacchaeus, just in front of the whole crowd and in the presence of Jesus, said, I've decided to confess my faults. I've decided to pay back monies that I have taken unjustly. If I have, I'm going to give it back four times. Here comes Jesus. Here, listen. Here comes Jesus. Someone will surely protest, but Jesus said, This day has salvation come to this house. Luke 19, 9 and 10. Please do a little homework and discover that the Greek root for salvation used here, and I have the Strong's number, offers several possible meanings. Here's one. Quotes, This day has a Savior or Deliverer come to this house. That's proper. Where is Zacchaeus today? Come on. He's dead. Where are all the people Jesus said, I forgive you? They're dead. Salvation means you ain't dead no more. You're gone. Salvation is out of here. When Christ returns, I will be saved. That's what I want. I know that's what you want. I believe that's what everybody on this rock wants, whether they know it or not, understand it in those terms or not. Okay. 
We've set the stage. So I'm going to read the words of one, one stanza, the words of this hymn, Whiter Than Snow, that we took note of a couple of Sabbaths ago. 318 is the hymn number if you want to look at it. But it's the words of this that are a prayer. Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. That's what we're talking about. That's what salvation is, is perfectly whole. I long to be perfectly whole. I want you or thee forever to live in my soul. Break down every idol, cast out every foe. Now, listen, wash me and I will be what? Whiter than snow. Whiter than snow. Yes, whiter than snow. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. So Jesus came. This is 2,000 years ago. Jesus came as a human being. He waited until he was 30 years of age before he started preaching and teaching. Why did he wait so long? Come on. It was Jewish law. I didn't say God's law. It was Jewish law that a man could not be a teacher of the people until he was at least 30 years of age. So Jesus is keeping human law, respecting human law. Did he do any teaching before that? But not publicly. He did that in, on special occasions. One memorable occasion was when he was 12 years of age. And he went to church. And he confounded the wise men. He asked questions that they never thought of before. He introduced subjects and topics in the Word of God that they had not seen before. Now when Jesus turned 30 years of age, he began his ministry. Where did his ministry begin? Come on, what event? Wedding. wedding feast. Father in heaven, we want to understand better for our own hearts, our own minds, our own experience. We want to understand better what you are doing of necessity to save us from this present evil world. We ask for forgiveness. Undeserved, but we ask for forgiveness of our sins. And we thank you for promising to forgive us. All sins that men have committed shall be forgiven them, Jesus said. But we need more than forgiveness. We need new hearts, new minds. We need to be made brand new inside and out. That's what we want to talk about. I'm asking you to be present here with us today. As we open your word, I pray you will open our hearts, open our minds, give us a better and larger understanding of what Jesus is doing as our great high priest. And I thank you in his name. Amen. Well, I'm in the book of Hebrews. If you have a Bible close by, I'd like for you to get to the book of Hebrews. And uh, my, there are many places in Hebrews. But I'm in chapter 10. Now we need a, we need a, a setting for what we're going to talk about here, what we're going to try and dig into and understand better. We need, we need some background, some setting. You must understand that in Jesus' day, in the days of the disciples, in the days of when the New Testament was being written, most people were illiterate. What does that mean? Come on. Didn't mean they were stupid, but it means they had no formal education in reading, writing, and arithmetic. And this is why again and again and again in the Gospels, you will find Jesus and the disciples and the record over and over again is the scribes and the Pharisee, 
the scribes. Who were the scribes? Come on. They were the guys who had gone and gotten some formal education and they could read and write. And they were keeping the records. This is why you had, for example, the Gospel of Luke written by Luke, compiled by Luke, and Luke was a person who had formal education. He was not illiterate. But most people in Jesus' day were illiterate. Most people on this rock today are illiterate. If they can read and write, they are illiterate in Scripture, in the Bible. They are unread and unknowing. The Gospel of John, please listen, the Gospel of John is God's answer to the illiterate, to the, to the people with little education. The Gospel of John is C spot run. Spot is my dog. And if you could see the Gospel of John in the Greek, you, you would know that's exactly what it is. It is so simple and yet so profound. There are thousands of books that have been written on the Gospel of John. John was not a person of letters. And it's very, very evident in the, his version of the gospel. I, he could read and write, but it was very limited. He was not a formally educated person. But God used John to speak to most of the world that's not formally educated. And so when you come along and you find whether it's the Baptists or the Pentecostals or whoever it is, and they are reprinting just the little gospel of John, just the little book of John, and handing it out. Every, fantastic. Many a person has been converted, heart changed, just by reading the gospel of John. Well, there are some people, however, who are more formally educated. And God has to reach them and speak to them as well. And so Hebrews is as far away from John as you can get. And yet they're both dealing with exactly the same topic, salvation. So God wants to speak to those who are well educated and, you know, and God wants to speak to those who are simple hearted and simple minded. God wants people to understand what the plan of salvation, there's that word salvation, what the plan of salvation is all about. So I'm in chapter 10 of Hebrews. And uh, I think I'll begin in verse 24 of chapter 9. We're just going to share a few verses. I'm in the King James. But I tell you again, I brought along the New Century Version and the New English Version, and we're going to share some of these same verses, and you're going to be surprised how much clearer some of these modern versions are. I'm in verse 24, chapter 9 of Hebrews. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true. Now, the holy places made with hands would be referencing what? The earthly sanctuary, the one that was made with hands down here. For Christ is not entered into the holy places. There was a sanctuary. Tell me where the holy places were. They were in and under the tent. There was one place that was not, quotes, considered a holy place, and that was the outer what? Now, what happened in the outer court? Come on. The altar of sacrifice was there. And who was offered on the altar of sacrifice? The lamb, the substitute. You listening? Jesus could and did in his earthly life and ministry 
enter into the outer court of the sanctuary, the temple in Jerusalem. He could enter into the outer court, but not the first apartment. As a matter of fact, the public didn't go into the first apartment. Only the priests were allowed, priests plural, were allowed to go in there, and only at set times. And then the most holy place, who and who alone was allowed to go in there? High priest. High priest. So let's find Jesus in the sanctuary. Can we find him in the outer court? Yes. He's the lamb. He's the offering. He's the bread. He's the flour. He's the dove. He's all of those things that were being offered. Can we find him in the first apartment? Not as a man, but as a heavenly substitute. Come on. So was he in the altar of perfume? Come on. Sweet incense, the altar of incense. Was he there in the first apartment? Yes. Not as a man, not bodily, but as a spirit, the, the sweet perfume represents which part of divinity? Come on. The Holy Spirit. There's the altar of incense. Now we got the candelabra over there. How many lights, how many candles, how many fires were on this candlestick? No, seven. Seven. What did the fire represent? And they were all together with one accord in the upper room, and the sound of a rushing mighty wind came, and tongues of what? Nine. And what else was there in that first apartment? Come on. There was the candle, there was the incense, and the table of showbread. What did the bread represent? Jesus said, your fathers didn't give you that bread. I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. So how did Jesus get into the first apartment? As a man? No, no, no. How did he get into the first apartment? As the Spirit of God. As the Spirit side of God, divinity. And then let's get past that great veil. Who and who alone could go beyond the veil and not lose their lives? The high priest and the high priest alone. And only once, only once, at a, an appointed time, could the high priest go beyond the veil. Now, was that appointed time important to the Jews? In the whole sanctuary year, the day of at one man or atonement, the day of judgment, when the high priest goes beyond the veil to appeal to the Almighty One, the one on the throne, to make an appeal for the people, he could only go one time. If the high priest is going in, in behalf of the people. And there is only one time, and it is an appointed time. Um, would, it, would it be meaningful to try and determine when that time is? Yeah, 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 yeah. What was, what was the command to Israel on the Day of Atonement? And it was to... It, every man, every man of age had to appear, okay? And if they did not, if anyone stayed away on the Day of Atonement, what was the judgment? So Jesus is in the outer court, Jesus is in the first apartment, but not as a man. Let's look at this again. For Christ is not entered, verse 24, not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are figures of the true. Where is the true? Heaven. Which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. 
So what did the apostles believe about this? And this was, I think, written by Paul, but it doesn't matter. What did they believe was taking place immediately when Jesus went to heaven? What did they think? He went into the Holy of Holies to appear in our behalf. And it says in the book of Hebrews, once in the end of the world. So how am I going to take that apart and understand what's going on? It was not the end of the world. Did the disciples believe it was the end of time? Does the book of Hebrews open? Now, once in the end of the world hath God appeared in the, you know, person of his son. No. How do, we, how do you and I work this out? Because there's always somebody standing over your shoulder saying, You're changing scripture. No, I'm trying to understand scripture. I'm trying to put pieces of a grand puzzle together. You know, it's really strange. My wife tries to hook and crook me into making, putting puzzles together. She and Stephanie love to put puzzles together. And I, they got my grandkids infected now. I can't stand puzzles. I hate puzzles. Except Bible prophecy puzzles. And they drive me nuts. I want to understand what's going on. Let's look at it again. Chapter 9. Christ not entered, but he's in heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others, other animals, other creatures, other offerings. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin. To do what with sin? To put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, after this the judgment. See, Christianity stumbles all over this stone of offense. Christianity believes all of this is a done, finished deal. But if you read and keep reading, you will see that the judgment does not take place until the end of the world. And 2,000 years have gone by since this. Let's go on. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many 2,000 years ago. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without what? Is that without sin on himself or is that without sin on people or let's try and sort that one out for a minute. Without sin unto salvation. If it's unto salvation it's without sin. We're not taking sin into heaven. We're not it, it, the book closes in Revelation telling you no sinners are going in. So I want to take you back in your thinking to the book of Acts. We don't need to turn there. We're very familiar with what happened. Wait here, Jesus said, until you receive power. The disciples waited as Jesus commanded in the upper room. And then comes the rushing mighty wind. And then comes the tongues of fire. How many people were affected or infected? Come on. How many were in the upper room? 120. And what did these evidences of the Holy Spirit at work in these 120 persons, what followed? Come on. They went out into the streets and began doing what? Preaching. Preaching under the unction of the Holy Spirit. Teaching. Now Peter kind of pipes up because a lot of the folk in town in Jerusalem said they're drunk. 
How did they come to that conclusion? How did, they, how did that idea even come about? Because there was 120 people speaking what? Did it sound confusing? Yes, it did. And so someone in the crowd or several in the crowd said, they're drunk. Now Peter pipes up. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Peter says, uh, they're not drunk. But this is that which was spoken of by Joel the prophet. It shall come to pass in the last days that I will pour out my spirit on uh, only the churchgoers. Only the good guys. None of the bad guys. Is there, is there ample scripture to suggest that the rain falls on the just and the unjust? Don't you wish God would not be that way? Don't you wish God would sort it all out and tell everybody on the rock they've got the truth, follow them? Doesn't work that way. Now Peter preaches a powerful sermon. It was so powerful under the unction and power of the Holy Spirit that thousands made a decision to follow Christ in a day. Two, three thousand or more. And here was the punchline. You better repent. You better repent, Peter said, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. Now he has just said that the times of refreshing has come. He also said at the end of the world. It was a time of refreshing. But where are all those people? Did they all go to heaven? No. 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 If you keep reading in the book of Revelation, were their sins blotted out? Not yet. Now once in the end of the world, he has come to do something. What is it that the high priest does on the day of at one minute? Come on. He prays that their sins may be blotted out. And th this is fascinating to me because in the book of Revelation, there's the book of life, the book of life, the book of life, all through the Bible. The book of life, the book of life. Names written in the book. But at a certain point in the book of Revelation, the book of life is now retitled the Lamb's Book of Life. That happens when Christ goes in as our great high priest. That event has not yet taken place yet. As a great high priest to blot out sin. That will happen at the end. That will happen at the time appointed. That will happen. I'm in chapter 10. Follow with me. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, we're talking about shadows and types, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. That's a lot of double talk. In other words, the fact that they came every year to the sanctuary and brought offerings of blood and they had to do it the next year again, and they had to do it the next year again, and they had to keep doing it. That is evidence in and of itself that the blood did not do something. It did not blot out their sins. It did not make the comers there unto perfect. Verse 2, For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. Oh, here we go. Here we are. Here's the crux of this whole thing. I'm a sinner. Some of you are half sinners. Is that what the Bible teaches? 
No, we're all sinners. And if we are sinners, we're guilty. Now, if a person is guilty, what does that suggest? That they know something. That they're guilty. That they did it. That they're not deserving of forgiveness. They're not deserving of grace. They're not deserving of going to heaven and standing in God's clean heaven. They're not deserving. They know that. And it's a matter of conscience. No more conscience of sins. We all have guilty consciences. But on the day, when the day comes, the day of judgment, the day when Christ speaks in heavenly places, sins will be what? Will all sins be blotted out? Careful. No, not all sins. Well, how will God make a determination as to who gets in? Oh, here, I like this guy right here. He pays tithe. He doesn't smoke. Goes to church every time they open the doors. I like this guy. Is that how God's going to do this? Here's how it's going to boil down. Here's how it's going to work out. Real simple. A power, a satanic power, is going to come at the time of the end and is going to urge nations, kings, rulers, and governments, going to urge nations to pass laws that demand what? <clears throat> I've got an image here. When I play the music and I have the proclamation read, everybody do what? Bow down. All of this is typed. All of this is foretold. So it's real simple, real simple, how God is going to determine who gets in and who doesn't. Except it's not God making the determination, it's the person himself or herself that's making the determination. And it's really very simple, real simple, to get to heaven. Is that what Jesus said? Oh, it's so simple to get to heaven. No, 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 it's not simple. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be fun. It's going to be terrible. It's going to be beyond terrible. It's going to be horrible. Because if you don't bow down, the furnace is heated how many times hotter? You know, if you read real close, you know how many lines were in Daniel's lines then. It's right there between this verse and that one. Parentheses. Seven lines. Listen, folk, generations have come and gone. They've had their own tests. They've had their own trials. But the last generation is going to have the test to end all tests. And what is that? If any man worship the beast, receive his mark, his number, or his name, the, sh the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. So how is a person going to be, have their sins, how's a person going to have their sins blotted out when this time of blotting out comes? Come on. Who will make, who will make that decision, God or the person? The answer is? Yes. I want to read this uh, living translation right here. Just a few verses in chapter 10 of Hebrews. New English. Let me start in verse 1 of chapter 10. We just a few verses here. For the law contains but a shadow and no true image. I like that. that. That's really what this is saying in simple terms. No true image of the good things which were to come. It provides for the same sacrifices year after year. And with these, it can never bring the worshipers to perfection for all time. In other words, the earthly sanctuary cannot perfect us. The work of the earthly sanctuary cannot bring us to perfection. It's when the high priest enters the one up there, the true, 
Let's go on. If it could, these sacrifices would surely have ceased to be offered because the worshipers cleansed one cleansed once for all, would no longer have any sense of sin. Conscience is clean. No longer a sense of sin. But instead, in these sacrifices, year after year, sins are brought to mind because sins can never be, sins can never be removed by the blood of bulls and goats. That's why at His coming into the world, He says, Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. We're talking about earthly sacrifice and offering. But thou hast prepared a body for me. Whole offerings and sin offerings thou didst not delight in. Then I said, here am I. As it is written of me in the scroll, I have come, O God, to do thy will. So there was this one occasion that Peter piped up and he said to Jesus, No, we're not going to let this happen to you. And what did Jesus, how did Jesus respond to Peter? Get out of the way, Peter. He didn't call him Peter. Get out of the way, who? Satan. Who wanted to stop and wants to stop the work of salvation? The enemy of God and man. Satan. The end of the world is all about a final showdown coming. Just a few more verses. For he says, verse 8, Sacrifices and offerings, whole offerings and sin offerings, you did not desire nor delight in, although the law prescribed them. And then he says, I have come to do thy will. He thus annuls the former to establish the latter. And it is by the will of God that we have been consecrated through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So, what is being said here is when Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago, they believed, the apostles believed and preached that this was the end of sin. Don't we wish? Every priest, verse 11, stands performing his service daily and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never remove sins. But Christ offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, took his seat at the right hand of God, where he waits henceforth until his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are thus consecrated. Here we have also the testimony of the Holy Spirit. He first says, This is the covenant which I will make with them after those days. Now what the writer of Hebrews is saying is, after those days has already come. No. The writer of Revelation shows that after those days has not yet come. What was the last book of this scripture? We're talking about in years, timeline. What was the last book written that would be put into this book? It was the book of Revelation. Peter, Paul, James, and John, and the apostles were pretty well gone by 63 to 65 A.D. Listen, 63 to 65, they were pretty nearly all gone. John was the last one standing. How could that be? Because he was the youngest one of the bunch. And because God wrought miracles to keep him alive until the book of Revelation could be written. Where was John when he received the visions? He was confined to the Isle of Patmos. And he was instructed, write this down. Just like Daniel was instructed, write this down. And send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia. It's Asia Minor. We believe that John wrote the book of Revelation somewhere between 93 and 97 A.D. This is 30 years past Peter, Paul, James, and John. Not John. This is 30 more years. And John has 
the work to do for the church to tell the story not that he's a kid anymore he's in his 80s and whatever the church needed to understand now the book of Revelation the focal point of the book of Revelation is especially when you get to chapter 14 it's circling all around the previous chapters inclusive circling all around the beast that's coming the beast the beast the beast the beast the beast and when the beast shows up God has a message to go to every kindred tongue nation and people and what is the message simple terms if any man what worship the beast receive his mark his number or bow down if any man bows down to the beast he'll pay for it every religion on this rock and there are many as you know every religion on this rock has a, a list a catalog of what that religion believes is sin The American Indians, we call them Native Americans, we think they were the first after the flood to get over to this part of the world when it was relatively uninhabited. And uh, they have their own version, they had their own version of what was sin. There's a God of the mountain, and you better not offend the God of the mountain. You'll be sorry. There's a God of the river. You better not offend the God of the river. The waters will dry up. You better not offend the God of, the God of, the God of. You know, the Egyptians had their many gods. As a matter of fact, every religion, with the exception of Christianity and Judaism and Islam, had their many gods. Crocodile gods. Dog gods, cat gods, frog gods, you name it. And it was a sin to offend any one of these gods. Well, how would you do that? Well, let me tell you how it plays out in some parts of the world, like India and over in that part of the world. They believe that a cow is their relative who died and came back as a cow. You listening? And therefore, we don't eat cows. It's a sin to eat cows. If you were in that part of the world and you decided, that, well, I'm going to have a hamburger, you might not live long enough to have the hamburger. Because it's a sin to eat cows. Everybody in Religionville out there has a list of sins. I'm so thankful that Adventist Christians don't have a list of sins. I wouldn't know what to do. I had to go to college, take the ministerial course to find out that if I didn't breathe correctly, I was sinning. If I didn't chew each bite of food that I put in my mouth, a respectable number of chews, I was sinning. If I ever was depressed, I was sinning. I thought I knew as a Christian what sin was until I joined Adventism. And then I found out that we have our own list. It finally came to the point in my Christian, Adventist Christian experience that I began to hear things like this in sermons well meaning, well intentioned but the reason Jesus hasn't come is because the church hasn't cleaned itself up yet and when we get cleaned up Jesus will come I've heard that preached It's a failure, it's a, it's a misunderstanding, a gross misunderstanding of what's going on here. If the church could clean itself up, the church doesn't need Jesus. 
We don't need the high priest if we can clean ourselves up. If we can do all the right things, we don't need a Savior. What we're waiting for, looking for, longing for, is a Savior. Not a theoretical, but a real Savior. And the message of Revelation is that it has to go to every kindred, tongue, nation, and people. And what is that message? Jesus himself in Matthew 24 and verse 44 says, And this gospel of the kingdom, this good news of the kingdom must first be preached for a witness to all nations, then the end can come. What is it that everybody needs to hear? What? That God not only forgives sins, He is promising in the day of judgment to do what with our sins? Block them out. Now that is different. That has never happened. It has been typed, it has been shadowed, it has been preached. It was believed 2,000 years ago to be taking place. But it wasn't. But I think it's more than possible that you and I are living at the time of the end. The end of what? Come on, the end of what? The end of the sanctuary services which deal ultimately with sin. So listen to these verses. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, it says. Old things are passed away. All things are become what? When does this happen? When the high priest makes the pronouncement, whoever is righteous, let him be righteous. And whoever is unjust or filthy, let him be filthy. That's it. That's it. The world does not understand that the day of judgment is at hand. Ellen White says we have a judgment hour message. Something to say to the world. We have a judgment hour message. I've had the privilege, listen, I've had the privilege of sitting at the feet of some very godly, well-educated, well-intentioned professors, ministers, Sanhedra, we could say. I've had the privilege of sitting at the feet of some of these professors in college and in seminary. And I've had the privilege of reading things that some of these well-intentioned godly persons have written about the sanctuary and the plan of salvation and, and various other things. I do not pass judgment on these persons. There might have been a time when I would say, oh, they're mistaken. They're not mistaken unto death, but they haven't yet, they have yet to see the larger And the sanctuary doctrine or teaching is one of the pillars of Adventism. Sadly, it never gets beyond, well, this is the outer court and this is the first apartment and this is the holy place. And it really doesn't get past that. Not even in theory. So I'm going to close and I'm going to ask it in the form of, do it in, in the form of a question. We've just been reading in Hebrews here, and it was the opinion of the writer of Hebrews, I believe the Apostle Paul, but it was the opinion of the writer that Jesus was in heaven right now, and he's closing down business in the sanctuary. All you have to do is read the book of Hebrews. All you have to do is go and read First and Second Peter. All you have to do. John says in First, Second, and Third John, we know it's the end, guys. We know it's the end. Because Antichrist is going to come, and he's already here. See, God allowed these men to be convinced, persuaded and convinced, that the end had come. Was God 
performing a dirty trick. I mean, did God know it was going to time was going to stretch on past? Is there any? Is God surprised by anything that has come and gone, and is yet to come? No, no. What's that? It was the end of their time, their days. It happened to Abraham, it happened to Isaac, it happened to Jacob, it happened to Noah, it happened to... And by the way, it happened to Jesus. This is why in Hebrews opens that when he got there to heaven, his father said to him, Son, come here and sit down. Until. Do we have anything in prophecy about when the sun stands up? There is a time, at that time shall Michael stand, the great prince, that's high priest, the great prince which stands for the children of thy people. There's going to be a time of trouble such as never was. Why, with Michael standing up, should there be a time of trouble? Come on. Because what is coming? We're going to have a Star Wars. We're, we're going to see angelic forces and angelic forces warring against one another down here as they did up there. Does that make any sense? Now, you, you and I were not around when it happened up there. Some of us may be around when it happens down here. Is there anything in Scripture that suggests some of us, somebody is going to be standing around and come a little while and hide here under the shadow of this rock until the indignation passes over. <clears throat> yeah. If you and I are fortunate or unfortunate enough to <laughs> be alive to the end, there is the promise of shelter. Because thou hast put thy trust in me, because you have kept my word, because, 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 I will keep you in the hour of temptation that shall come upon how much of the world? All the world. All the world. Something happened a few years ago. I was in Maryland. I was employed by Amazing Facts. And Elder Cruz asked me to go to Maryland, this particular place in Maryland, and hold an evangelistic series. And, uh, I mean, I'd done plenty of preaching, but I had never had a public evangelistic meeting like the Amazing Facts series that I was responsible for. We had billboards, we had handbills, we had all kinds of things inviting the public to come, and the public came. There, 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 there wasn't a handful of Adventists in the bunch. No church there. They wanted to raise up a church. And the people came in. And, uh, of course, I'm the star. I'm the attraction. I'm the person on the, on the billboard and on the handbill and whatever. And so I stand at the door welcoming the folk as they come in. I tell them, now get a good seat so you can see because we've got a big screen. We're going to put pictures up. Get a good seat. And the people file in and they take their places and human beings are strange critters. They just, you know, whatever seat they sit in the first night, it's theirs. <laughs> Don't you dare come tomorrow night and sit in my seat. That's my seat. Oh, huh, Patty. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So you you watch from the front. The people think they're looking at you, and really you're looking at them. And you are trying in your humanity to sort out what their response is. So you look at their faces and you watch their eyes and you you know. When you get two or three weeks into the series and you're it's time to get out to business now and ask for a decision. You've already worked it out in your mind. I, I've already figured out they've come every night. They're going to take a stand. 
you know, this, and I don't know. And I want to tell you something about reality. About reality. Most, not many, most of the people you thought would take a stand didn't. And there were some who came in for only three or four meetings, took a stand straight away. You listening? I had to learn as a young evangelist, I had to learn that you don't know. Don't pass judgment. You don't know. You cannot read the heart. You may read the face and think you know, but you don't. People are strange critters. So when it was my turn as the evangelist to ask people to make a decision and choose, Maybe I had the sense that, oh, this is an important, this is a once in a lifetime, this is a once in eternity decision. I, d I don't think I would reason that way anymore. I believe God keeps knocking on the door until the door closes. You listening? What the end is all about is God is going to announce to the whole world that the door is closing. That's it. That the door is closing. That's why you send Moses and Elijah and maybe Enoch. That's why you preach to every kindred, tongue, nation, and people that the hour of his judgment is what? Is not, is coming. Is come. Present tense. It sounds exciting. I think it's about the scariest sermon that will ever be preached. That's what I think. Father in heaven, we are flesh, flesh, flesh. You know us. You know everything about us. We thank you for not leaving us to ourselves. But empowering us, infusing us, inspiring us with your Holy Spirit. Jesus said, if you would ask, your Heavenly Father will give you the Holy Spirit. He gives to those who ask. And so we're asking this morning that you will indwell each one of us. Give us a heart to approach heaven and approach your throne and approach Jesus. Give us a heart that is drawn heavenward and not repulsed, not turned away. We thank you for the little time of grace we still enjoy. But enjoyment is fading. Our nation is sick and in trouble. The world is sick and in trouble. We are waiting, waiting, waiting for heaven to respond in one last great work of grace. I thank you for each person who is here, each person who will hear. Save us, Lord, because we cannot save ourselves. And I thank you in the precious name of Jesus for his sake. Amen. Amen.